let me uh, take this time and uh, to introduce uh, Jim Bregman, 10th degree black belt, uh, America's first Olympic medalist in judo, a, a well-renowned uh, figure. President be asking uh, Steve Cohen some questions. And with that, uh, I'll turn it over to Jim Bregman. Well, this will be the first in a series of lectures and discussion groups on the state of American judo. Our first guest will be Steve Cohen. In the future, we'll have Jimmy Pedro, Travis Stevens, Jason Morris, and perhaps one or two other distinguished American judoka. And based on Steve's recommendation at the conclusion of the series of individual discussion groups, we could have a panel discussion with all of the presenters present so that people who participate in the Zoom session could interact with the entire panel. And I'm sure we're going to get a diverse uh, set of ideas on the current state of American judo. It's my distinct privilege and honor to introduce to you my friend and fellow Olympian, Steve Cohen. I uh, am gonna take a moment to go through Steve's background at length. This will be a YouTube presentation and some of the people who will be participating in YouTube uh, may or may not be familiar with Steve's background, but his competitive record is substantial. Uh, starting as an 11 year old, he won a silver medal at the Junior Nationals in Chicago and continued as a youth winning bronze, silver, gold, gold, silver high school, Maccabea Games gold medal in 1973, national championship in 73 bronze medalist. I'll skip some of these. Uh, Pre-Olympic bronze medalist, Montreal, Canada. Pan Am Games bronze medalist. Attended the world championships in 75. Senior silver medalist at the senior nationals in 76. Alternate Olympian to the Montreal Games in 76 senior national gold medalist in 77. Again, Maccabea Games medalist in 77. Senior national gold medalist in 85. Pacific Rim Tokyo bronze medalist. World trials in Colorado Springs gold medalist in 1985. World championship participant Seoul, Korea in 1985. Uh, in Cuba at a Cuban international tournament, won a bronze medal. Goodwill Games in Moscow, silver medal. Senior Nationals in Pittsburgh, gold medalist. US Open Colorado Springs, gold medalist. World Championship competitor in 1987. Olympic trials gold medalist in 1988, attended the 1988 Seoul Olympics as a member of the U.S. Olympic team. That is a long and distinguished career as an athlete. Not only has Steve been a prominent athlete throughout his career after retiring from competition, he became a renowned head coach. And I'll just go through some of his head coaching activity going backwards in time from 2000. He, all of these were head coach positions. He was the head coach of the Olympic team in Sydney, Australia, coached the European tour, Germany and Australia, world championships, Birmingham, England, European tour, Germany and Australia, coached the European tour in France, Australia, and Germany, 
in 88, 1998, sorry, Pan Am Championships in Santiago, Coach the Kano Cup in Tokyo, Japan in 98, 97. He was the world championship coach for the Paris World Championships in France. 97, head coach European Tour, Germany and Australia. In 96, he was the head coach at the Kano Cup in Tokyo, Japan. Again, 96 World Championships in Porto, Portugal. Head coach European Tour of Germany and Hungary in 95. 94, head coach World Championships in Cairo, Egypt. He was the head coach of the Pan American Championships in 93 in Puerto Rico. In 1990, he was the head coach in Sardinia in Italy. There are very few people on the American stage over time that have had as distinguished a career in competition and coaching as Steve has. It's my distinct privilege and honor to introduce Mr. Steve Cohen, who will present us with his views on the state of American judo. Thanks so much, Steve. Jim. <clears throat> Uh, I just want to make one little correction to the coaching uh, announcements you were making of me. The uh, <clears throat> and and the reason I'm making it because it's important. Okay. The early '90 coaching in uh, Puerto Rico and Portugal and in uh, <clears throat> Egypt, mm -hmm. those were junior uh, coaching. Okay. So in in when I went to coach at the Olympic level, I coached four years as the head junior coach first. So the players that developed into the Olympians and the top players, I was with them four years prior. And that's Excellent. really, and when we get into that, we'll talk a little more, but that's the necessary way you have to become coach. So you're with the athletes, watching them develop and develop them as they're going forward. So I didn't have one trip with these guys. I had eight years. Right. And that intimate knowledge of your players over a span of eight years is vitally important to international competition. With, 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 without question, without question. So the state of American judo, simple question. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> I would tell you that uh, in, in my humble opinion, the state of American judo today is dire. It's uh, in, in, in a place that is is almost at a point of no return. And I say this humbly, but as Paul told you, I'm an honest guy and I say, I call it the way I see it. Uh, I'll, let me go back a little bit in time and give you a little history of the development of judo and, and why at one time American judo was thriving in the United States, even before it was thriving around the, the world. You know, I mean, cause it starts in our own country. You know, uh, in the 1960s, you know, the, uh, the, the, we had, judo was big around our country in the 60s. Go to the East Coast, New York, Washington, go to California, all over California. There were clubs all over the place. Chicago, Wisconsin, uh, Seattle, anywhere you went, there were big judo clubs. We had Yudanshikais, and and we had a good amount, a majority of the students, I would say, I guess maybe not, but the majority were second generation Japanese because the parents were the first generation and they believed judo was a critical sport activity for their kids to do. <clears throat> I did judo in a Buddhist temple growing up, you know? It was very Japanese. The culture was part of it, but it was it, it it was it was very big, and the competitions were fierce. Now, in the early '60s, there really wasn't junior judo. It wasn't until 1964 when we started having junior championships. My first junior tournament when I was seven or eight years old, my division was 12 and under. 
they didn't they didn't know what to do with junior judo. We had to build it and develop it. Uh, the person that was in charge of junior judo from the very beginning is someone that stayed close to my heart my whole life, and that's Jimmy Takamori. He was put in charge of junior judo, and 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 he was uh, someone that seemed to be the, certainly the right person for that job. And in 1965, we had a junior national championship in Chicago. And it, I have a picture of all the winners. And in that picture, there must be 10, 12 Olympians. 76 Olympians. 72 Olympians, kids that were young in our judo system that because of our, because of the system we had, they stayed in judo. There were tournaments all over the country. Judo was a sport that, 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 that gave back something. So uh, the parents liked it. The kids liked it. You know, the, the, the judo was good. And there's one other major factor there was a magazine. So when I was a young kid and I started judo at five, you know, when I was nine years old, I had a hero. And that hero was Jim Bregman. Now, I never met Jim at that time. I eventually met him not too much longer, but I knew about him from a magazine. We had Judo Illustrated. So not only could I see the results of the junior nationals, I saw the results of the Olympics. And there I saw a guy with an American flag with rings on his gi, an American winning a medal in judo. Boy, was I ready to do judo when I was a kid then. That was it. That was inspiration for me and probably almost all the other kids. And it was, it was wonderful. It was wonderful. So I would tell you that not only was I someone who loved to do judo, I was also a fan. And that magazine allowed me to be a fan. I was able to follow Japanese judo. I knew who Okano was. I watched him win the All Japan Championships, not in video, in a magazine, you know? So as a kid, I was getting information and I was kept in the loop and I was able to follow judo. So those things, the, the, the Yuranshikais, you know, the, the, the senseis. And the thing about the senseis then is that the senseis didn't teach per se, not the way I teach. But what they did is they did good judo. So you were around good judo all the time. So when you watch them play judo, they didn't have bad habits. They didn't bend down. They didn't do lousy tayatoshis or uchimatas. Their judo was good. So you only saw good judo, you know? So it, it, it was something that, that as a kid, just like if you're, a, if you're playing baseball or football and you're, you're a junior, you're watching kids in high school or in college, you're seeing quality athletes play, and you're learning that way. We were able, we were able to learn judo in our judo club from our, our, our the group above us, the seniors above us, and the senseis. I could sit here today, and I won't do it. I could tell you when I was a kid who the senior judo players in my judo club, Uptown Judo Club, and Mike Ogata being one of them, if any of you remember that name. But there were Ralph Pesci, Guys that I watched do judo every single day. I learned from them. It's like playing little league baseball and staying and watching the, uh, you know, the triple A play. You know, you're getting the, you know, it, it's just, you, you get caught into it. Another thing is that in the early days of judo, when you went to a tournament, you didn't get your award until the tournament was all over. So you were forced to watch judo. Today, a parent walks into a tournament and they say, how long is this going to take? I got a date. I got to go to the swimming pool. I got to go out. I got plans for lunch. How soon can I get my kid out of here? You know, you get in there. When's the fight going to start? My God, I, I remember when I was uh, 14 to 15 fighting junior and senior divisions. My God, I fought at nine in the morning and I fought at eight at night. And no one left <laughs> because you had to stay there to get your award. So everyone watched judo. We don't watch judo anymore, even though it's all on YouTube and stuff. You know, we just don't watch it anymore. So that 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 to me is 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 a very very 
It's a big, big problem. And as I watch in the club that I'm at now, as kids develop, they have no one to look to. They have no one to watch. So as we got into the 70s, okay, and uh, judo was still big, you know, judo was very big. If you can imagine that in our senior nationals, we had close to a thousand competitors. Our junior nationals, we had an enormous, divisions were enormous and every single division, every Yudanshakai had a qualifying. So you only allowed three players from each division. And, and so there were another 30 people that couldn't even go to the nationals. And I'll tell you what, in California, there were times it was hard to qualify. When you have guys like Tosh Sano and Pat Burris and, and other guys, I mean, those are tough, tough divisions just to go to the nationals. So judo was deep. The depth was there. The, the, the system was there where you had to play. You don't just walk in the door. You had to play. So it, it, it made us much better for it. Uh, so w w when, when I look at the 70s, and certainly the, the, uh, the, the, the U.S., I guess judo was USJF. Everything was USJF then or AAU, whatever it was. Uh, and then we had the debacle in 1972, which which brought on the beginning of the of the USJA, which it, it which could have and should have been a great great way to go, but it became difficult again to work with with two or three organizations. <laughs> it just got to be really difficult. But no, but nonetheless, we produced in the 70s through the system that we had some of the greatest athletes we ever had. We weren't developing these athletes to be international champions. They certainly were good enough to be, you know, Pat Burris, Erwin Cohn, Jim Woolley, Alan Coage. These guys were top players. They could play anyone in the world. I saw Erwin play the world champion to a split decision. I saw Pat Burris beat Nevzorov. And if you don't know who Nevzorov is, you can take a look, maybe the greatest player ever. It's phenomenal, a Soviet player. So Jim Woolley. I mean, these are guys that could play anyone. They were great players, and that was part of our of our system that we had. Of I don't know if it was designed to be, but we had so many players and so many tournaments that we had to, you know, we had to be able to play judo. The clubs were big. You walked into a judo club at night for a nightly workout, there's 25, 30 people there. You know, you have you have two or three or four people that are that are top players, and the rest are club players that are there every single day. You know, and it's every day was a war, and that that's that's how we did judo back in the seventies. The eighties, we took it to another level. In the eighties, we started having camps and bringing our our juniors and seniors together, as we decided that we had to have a program that would develop our athletes to win internationally. When I stopped judo in 77, the only international tournaments I went to was you went to the world championships every other year and you went to the Pan Am games. Other than that, you didn't go anywhere. In 1985, when I came out of retirement, the first year back, I fought in more international tournaments that one year than the pre my whole previous life. You're going on European tours, you're going to Cuba, you're going on training camps in Japan, you're going all over. Your exposure was tremendous. So in the 80s, we started exposing ourselves to the judo so we could train with the top judo and develop a strategy of how to beat them. And that brought us the likes of Bob Berland, Mike Swain, Kevin Asano, you know, Jason Morris and Jimmy Pedro. I was fortunate at that time to be there as these guys developed. Bobby, of course, I, I, I started and taught judo. He was also my teammate. These guys played judo as good as anyone. As their judo foundation was strong and they went all over the country, they developed the style that could beat the Japanese and the Europeans. And let's not make light of it. Mike Swain had to beat Koga. <laughs> that was no easy task. 
besides the other guys he had to beat because the Soviet players were unbelievable. You know, I mean, it was just, it was tough. But we fought in all the tournaments. We fought in all the camps. You know, we went on our own to Japan to train. So in the 80s, we had a system that was supported by U.S. judo that really helped these players out. And in 1988, when Jimmy Pedro was still a junior, he traveled to Japan with us. In 87, he came to the World Championships with us. We knew we had a kid that had, that, that had a potential, and we brought him along. And this is the doing of like Bruce Toops, who was the director of development. He saw that that was how we develop. He saw the talent. And Jimmy was tough as can be back when he was a, still a, a young kid. And then as we saw him develop to be the best in the world. You know, so, so the, the system that we had with not only having camps and junior camps, our system forced us to compete. We had a fight in the Nationals. We had a fight in the U.S. Open. We had a fight in the Olympic Festival. The Olympic Festival was one round robin with seven people. So, I mean, you know, so Mike Swain had to beat all seven people in his division. And again, we're talking about we had depth in judo back then. You know, you had Reeser, you had Jefferson, you had, I mean, you guys, and my nephew, RJ, these, they were good, good players. Good players. You know, Jason had wars with uh, with Dave Faulkner to make the Olympic team. Tremendous matches, you know, but they had a fight all the time. We were always competition ready. Now, what's, what, what's happening now? I mean, we used to have a point system where athletes had to develop points within our country. When Erwin and I ran our tournament, our 48 kilo division had 25 girls in there. You can't find a division like that anywhere in the country. The 48 kilo division was huge. You know, they had a fight, you know? So after 2000, and mind you that in the 70s and 80s, we went from one magazine to three magazines, just so you know. So there were more people getting to see their name in lights, more kids getting to see their clubs highlighted. There were more people on the cover. I was fortunate. They put me on the cover of the magazine a few times. Listen, I was 16 years old. I thought it was pretty cool. I brought it to school to show the girls who would, right? You know, it, it, was, it, 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 was a, it was a big deal. Black Belt Magazine had the top 10 judo players in Japan, in Europe, and in the uh, United States. My brother and I used to stand outside the newsstand every day waiting for a delivery. We couldn't wait to see the magazine. We were fans. We wanted to know what was going on in Europe. We wanted to know what was going on in Japan. And certainly we wanted to see our own picture if we could. We don't have that anymore. Everyone walks around with a computer in their hand and no one knows what's going on. We don't have a system. People don't have to fight each other, you know? So you, you go to one or two tournaments somewhere, you pick a tournament in Peru or something, and maybe you luck out and take a bronze medal and you get some points, and hopefully you can make uh, be, be in the top number, whatever you need to make the, uh, the world team or something. But no one's battle ready. You know, I mean, they should be fighting in 15 tournaments a year. And, and they should have to be placing in these tournaments. So when I look at the situation at a national level where there's really no infrastructure to grow judo, uh, I find that uh, to be disheartening. There's no place to go. There's nothing to do. The junior divisions have so many divisions now. The, the, the divisions are sometimes two or three uh, long. You know, I, I told my, my nephews that, you know, you need to skip two tournaments and have three-day uh, training sessions. Might as well get 30 rounds of Rondori in a weekend, then two rounds and travel to Florida. Doesn't make sense. So I think there's a lot of fixing to do to make it right. Uh, I think it can be done, but there's a lot of fixing to do. But, there, but there's got to be a guy that understands judo 
who's going to make those changes? And I'm not volunteering. <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just saying. I'm, I'm just. I'm just saying that. Uh, that that I, I think that there's a, there's a way to do it if we go back to some of the old ways, force the people to fight. You know, more competition is better. And 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 that would be my suggestion, but. I was uh, one of the honors in my life I had, Jim, was being there to get give you your tenth degree black belt and being a part of that. Yes, thank and you. That was a that was a highlight for me. It was also very a shock to me going to that junior nationals, where the JA and JF junior nationals together had two hundred and fifty competitors. Erwin and I ran a junior nationals back in the eighties. There were fifteen hundred people. Exactly. I mean, what happened? Right. What happened? And that was just the JA Nationals, Junior National. You know, there's no kids doing judo anymore. What are we doing about that? So, you know, there, there, there's a lot of, there, there's, I don't know how we lost it. I don't know where we went wrong. I was gone for close to 20 years. But I know that things need to be changed if we're going to bring back judo in the United States. Thank you, Steve. That was a long um, answer. I'm sorry. <laughs> now, that was uh, very insightful, actually, and taking us through the various decades of judo's heydays. And then, are you there? I'm here. Okay, I'm sorry. Taking us through the decades of the heydays, and when judo clubs like the Detroit Judo Club Washington Judo Club, St. Ann Dojo, Uptown Dojo. These clubs had 100 to 250 people in them Absolutely. at any given time. So somewhere over these decades, the feeders and the local dojos have deteriorated and the overall participation rates in Judo have uh, diminished greatly. Um, Mickey has a question, Steve. How do you feel about the change about the five bad point system versus the Repishad system, those systems versus Ron Robin? Okay, so when I planned on talking, that was in my in my talk, but I didn't put it in there because I guess it got away from me. That's okay. So, so it's, it's, it's interesting because when I was growing up, you know, in order to win a junior nationals, you had to win eight matches, a senior nationals, you know, with a five point system, it forced you to throw for Epon. It's a flawed system. It's flawed without a doubt because you can win five matches and be out of the tournament. So it's, it, that, that, that is a flaw. However, however, you played Epon Judo. People tried to throw. They stood up and tried to throw. You don't go for one, you know, leg tackle or one, you know, knockdown or one penalty. You know, I know the rules have evolved and whatever, but I mean, the, the point is, is that people stood up and tried to throw. And, you know, when you look at the top players in the world, they're winning by throwing people. It's 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 important. Uh, what Steve, we, yeah. I'm, I'm sorry. I'm not sure if everybody knows what the five point bad point system is. Okay. I, I just before you 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 say because not everybody has worked under that. Where not everybody's old like us. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So the five point system <laughs> was if you if you got five points against you, you were out of the tournament. So if you won by Epon, that was zero points. If you won by a Wazari or a decision, that was one point. If you lost by a Wazari or a decision, that was two points against you. And if you lost by Epon, it was three points against you. Everybody was guaranteed two matches at least. And the other thing too is that there was a forced round robin at the end of the tournament. So, so when, uh, when you got to the finals, there had to be three left. And don't ask me why. When I was 15, I got screwed because in the junior nationals, there were only two guys left without points, me and David Fisher, and I beat David. So we should have been one and two. 
And that's what they told us. And they had to bring a guy back in who lost to come back after we had thought we won. And he ended up beating us both. So it wasn't, <laughs> it wasn't favorable. I wasn't happy, but the next <laughs> year I came back. But yeah, that, that, was, that was the system then. And like I said, the intention was good. And, uh, you know, in the United States, we can choose to run the tournaments the way we want to. You know, we don't have to run them the way the IJF does. You know, we should be running tournaments to develop our athletes, not, you know, not, not, not to be able to win internationally. That goes on as we develop them. Was that fair, Mickey? Yeah, I think that that was good. I think that the, what you're saying is, is that who wants to part of the problem i think is that who wants to go to florida and get one match you lose right. the first round to the wrong guy you're out you don't have any more matches that's a lot of money to spend so yeah. ha having a system where they're having more matches that they get more experience plus mm -hmm. having the camps like you said is a really good idea um with the the numbers that are going in the junior nationals and the um and the senior nationals, there's so few players, it's it's almost ridiculous that they go the repertoire system and you go, hey, Nick, it's it's it was it in Reno next year, and you get yeah. go there for well, some people are going to gamble, but you go there and you lose your first round and you have no more matches. Well, I guess I'm just gonna go to the slot machines. It's terrible. Well, you know, I spent a stint as director of junior development and there was a time Erwin and I ran national tournaments and we had our own tournament. When we had 1,500 kids in the junior nationals, it was true double. All the tournaments were true double. People don't like that. They don't have to fight again. You have true champions then. And every junior tournament is a developmental tournament. Steve, okay? could, you, could you explain what True double means. So true double is that you have to lose twice to be out. So if I lose my first match, the tournament goes on, and the one who is winner of the winner's pool, if I'm winner of the loser's pool, so he hasn't lost, and I have lost. Even if I fought him, we have to fight again because until I, until I lose twice, I'm still in the tournament. If I beat him, then we each lost once, and we fight again. Right. I've had many of my students in third match battles, many of them. And that's after eight, nine rounds, right. you know, and we're developing our athletes. That's the best way to do it. Now, I, I agree that, you know, if there's four kids in there, you may want to have a round robin or five, you know, where everyone fights everyone. The idea of how we end the tournament quicker blows my mind. People are in such a hurry to be done. They lose the idea of what we're doing here. We're here to develop athletes. You know, all tournaments should be true double. And, and the ones that aren't, it's, it's, it's a problem for me. It's a problem. And I think it's a huge mistake. A huge mistake. Well, Steve, what do you attribute? Well, going back historically, for those that don't know what happened in 72, could you explain the debacle? Well, <laughs> the, uh, the, the 72 was our Olympic trials. And it was quite a large tournament. And because we had TV coverage, and Jim, I, I was younger at the time. If I'm, if I'm wrong, you can correct me. But because we had TV coverage, the people in charge in their infinite wisdom decided that no matter what happened during the tournament, we were gonna have a round robin regardless. So if you lost uh, in, the, uh, in, in the preliminaries, in the round robin, that loss would normally count. But they said that it's not gonna count because they want the cameras to see the top three guys playing each other. So we fought the whole tournament with that understanding. And then when the round robin came, they changed their mind. Exactly. Right. And they said, you know what? We changed our mind. And what happened was the people in the, in the preliminary rounds who had the points to give, you know, didn't fight hard because they knew they were going to have to fight them for the, 
for, for, for the birth on the Olympic team. So the, the result of that change meant that the strategy each player was using under one set of ground rules evaporated when they changed the rules. Yes. Yeah. And, uh, you know, we, we had a system that wasn't for the athletes. And anytime you do that, it's, it, 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 it's a real mistake. Our system has got to be for the athletes. Uh, so this ended up, we ended up having another trials. And uh, again, the 72 team was a good team, but that was, a. Uh, and again, Jim, I, I remember this like it was yesterday, having you stand on a chair. I wasn't aware how short you were at that time. But they had <laughs> you standing on a chair and having maybe 50 athletes surrounding you saying, Jim, give us guidance. You were the Pied Piper. Everyone looked to you. Everyone looked to you for guidance because we were lost. The hierarchy said, we're doing this. You're getting screwed. But you know what? Too bad. It worth it. Right. So, uh, so that, that created a lot of animosity between the players and structure, the structure, the administrative structure of judo. It created a a friction, and uh, it was particularly graceful of Alan uh, and Jimmy Woolley yep. to go out and bow under these changed rules, shake hands, and walk off the mat. Mm -hmm. Their Olympic births were at stake, and at that point, um, Soon, soon after that point, the athletes basically revolted and there had to be lawsuits in order to get another trials put into place. But that kind of maladministration at the very highest level of American judo, to one degree or another, I believe, unfortunately, has prevailed over time. And I think that that has contributed somewhat to the development of a dysfunctional national decay of major participation at the club level and on up to the uh, Olympic and world level. Yeah, I, I, I can't say I disagree with you on that. Uh, being someone who was, you know, uh, my brother and I, and my brother was my leader, my mentor, and my teacher. Uh, we, we were judo players. We were a member of an organization that we had to be in order to compete. You know, so the, 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 the two organizations at that time were vying for that power to force people to join. And I don't think it's any different today, too. The USA Judo has that power. Mm -hmm. uh, other than that, they don't offer much of anything or nothing, actually. Right. Uh, yeah, it's, it's, it, it, it's a real shame. And we need a, a complete turnaround now and, and having someone come in and, and make a major change. Because what we're doing now is not working. It's not working. We're not going to develop athletes. We may have some people on the Olympic team, but there's a good chance we may have nobody. I mean, how do you figure that we have the, the, the we have a two-time gold medalist right now that has nothing to do with judo? You know, uh, Jimmy was was a successful coach and even a, probably a better administrator. He's not involved in in U.S. judo at all, at all. I mean, what a shame. Yeah. What a shame. So I, I don't know, uh, you know, I, th you know, the answer is we need to break it down and build it up again. Steve yes. and, and Jim, I'm sorry. Quick question: How do you feel about U.S. judo administrators or people who are actually not in judo? How do I feel? Yeah. Who's going to see? This? <laughs> Who's going to see this? Uh, <laughs> I, I, uh, I just find it very unusual that the, the, the director of 
uh, USA Judo is not a judo person at all. It, it's a big problem, Mickey. It's a massive problem. And I've spoken with them. It's a massive problem. It's a massive problem. We, we, need, we need to change. We need someone that likes, and, and he's not going to be happy I say this, but of Jimmy Pedro, someone who is, uh, has the knowledge, has the understanding, and has the administrative ability uh, to put together a group and put together a system that we could work together and run. Uh, th that that would be something worth trying, but you, you you're you're a hundred percent right. Uh, it was interesting that uh, well, I'll tell the story offline. But I I, I, <laughs> I, I I find that that there's a real misunderstanding of what's needed in judo, understanding the mind of the judoka, what keeps people in judo, what brings people to judo. If you're not in judo, you're not going to know that. Can't use hockey as an example. It's not the same. It's not the same. So you're hundred percent right, Mickey. That's a problem. It's a big problem. So what, what programs could be developed at the grassroots level to enhance the participation and retention rates and create more judo clubs, more, petition, more participation, <laughs> more retention at the ground level. It was my understanding, and again, I'm kind of an old guy, was my understanding that the Judo Incorporated group, when all of these iterations took place, was to focus on international competition and that the USJF and the USJA were to be grassroots organizations. So how can these grassroots organizations encourage and enhance local dojos? And how can we get local dojos to reach out into the general population to recruit and retain more members? Again, I had the privilege of being a kid in the Washington Judo Club with Sensei Takimori, Don Dreger, Ishikawa. And at any given time, we had 30 or 40 black belts. Mm -hmm. uh, we had a ton of brown belts. We had a ton of kids. The place was mobbed, okay? Now, when you go into a dojo, maybe you have 20 people. You have two, two black belts, a group of beginners, and maybe one or two brown belts. Am I exaggerating or? Well, if you're exaggerating, it's the other way. Okay. Yeah, there, there, there's, it, it, it's very difficult. So <clears throat> because we have no infrastructure anymore, you can't learn by watching. You know, you just can't. And I'll give you a quick example. When I was in, in when I was competing in the 70s, I started playing racquetball. It helped me keep my weight down. It was a good mm -hmm. game for me. I was an athlete. I liked playing it. I got to be pretty good. So I was playing for my club. I was an A player and I was you know, beating people, going to club tournaments. And the pros came to town. I said, oh my God, I'm going to go watch the pros. It took me 30 minutes to be able to follow the ball. The difference between me as a club <laughs> player and the pros was so vast, so vast. So to think a kid who's eight, nine, 10 years old or over is gonna watch Abe fight and say, I'm gonna learn from him, it ain't gonna happen. It's not gonna happen, it doesn't work that way. What we have to do is, and we don't have anything in our system now, no one's forced to fight in tournaments. The senior tournaments are nothing. No one, wa no one stays to watch anyway. The senior workouts are small. Where are, you gonna, what, where are they going to learn judo? Today, more than ever, it has to be taught. So who knows how to teach judo? Well, I don't know many who do. It's a problem. Uh, um, go ahead. Uh, one of the things that I had uh, spoke to Pat Burris about this a long time ago is that um, if we could get people to be encouraged to go to um, different training camps 
and or and or this be part of their promotional uh, improvement or their ability to go to international tournaments at each level there should be be um that these juniors have to be able to learn certain skills, not just the basic skills, but they might the addition, they have to be able to do a Sankaku turnover, they have to do the Cuban roll, they have to do something that each level needs to learn, go to a camp and learn these techniques, be able to demonstrate these techniques to go up to the next level. So here's the problem, so you, and, and, and I'm, I'm, I'm okay with that one way or the other. The problem is, is that, <clears throat> in order to do judo, you have to have a foundation. You have to have a foundation of balance, posture, position. You have to have, you have to have that, you know, it, it's like building a house. So you build a house and the foundation's weak and say, you know what, I'm going to put a room over to the left. It's going to hang over. It's going to be really cool. They're doing that in Russia. You put mm. that on there and the house collapses. You have to build the foundation first. I don't you're care right, what you're right. What you're doing, you need to build the foundation. Who knows how to build the foundation? Who knows how to teach that way? From day one, the first day you step on the mats, you need to start learning the foundation. You need to know how to stand. You need, you know, I, you know. I, I was talking to Jason the other day. You know, uh, Jason plays tennis all the time. I could play tennis, but I don't play tennis where I move my racket around to change my swings. That's an advanced game. I could never do that. You know. We need to teach kids how to move, how to stand. We need to teach kids the game of judo, where they're at relative to their opponent. When you think about this, you have a game of t-ball. Kids are four years old. The first thing they do, they hit the ball, and someone's got to grab the kid and run him to first base. How come? Because he doesn't know where to run. Who's teaching these kids where to run? They have no idea where to run. We put a gi on them, we put them out there, we show them a few throws, and that's it. We have to start teaching like we teach in kindergarten, first grade, and second grade. So now more than ever, what we need to do is separate our teachers by skill set, and we need to work together to develop the athletes that way. And I'll give you an example. Paul Jordan, I don't know if he's on the call anymore. I was, I at, Paul's, there. I was at Paul's club uh, uh, before COVID. Uh, I've been there several times. I'm still here. So I walked into to one of the classes. I had 30 girls, seven years old and under. Girls, okay, I looked at them and go, how the heck do you do that? That's a skill set we need. Now I'm telling you, that's only a quarter of his club. He's got 150 kids in his club that come to judo weekly and they love it. Okay, I don't care if you're a 10th degree black belt, no disrespect, Jim. I want to learn what this guy's doing. Absolutely. He's got people coming to his club like crazy. What is he doing? My nephews have 150 students. The okay. mats pr pr prior to COVID, there's 60, 70 kids in a kid's class. Okay, what are they doing right? Okay, I don't want to know how to get a point to go to Peru. I need to know how to build our grassroots and bring people into the dojos. And what we have to do with those people is we have to teach them and help them learn how to start to develop these athletes just with the basic learning skills so they can learn to build the foundation. Okay. So over time, historically, judo was a dominant martial art in this country or sport. Karate, BJJ, and all the rest of it have now surpassed judo. What are these clubs doing and what are the successful clubs in judo doing to attract and retain? Could we develop a best practices for club instructors to market this and get the children into the dojo. And then once they come into the dojo to develop teachers, to start them with ground fundamentals so that they enjoy the sport, like the sport and continue the sport throughout their lives, whether they go to the Olympics or whether they just use it as a lifetime recreational activity. Well, well first of all, 
understand that that the 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 culture, the cultural part of judo, and not as extreme as it was when you and I were younger, Jim, but you know, you're you're responsible for your gi. You have to keep yourself clean. You keep the mats clean. You know, you respect the people. You know, you 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 learn a sense of respect and order that helps you throughout your whole life. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's something that has to be kept in the game. The one thing that that I can't replace from Paul's dojo is Paul. Usually it has to do with the person. You know, my nephew Aaron, he is so in touch with every single kid and every it's, it's you know, he loves right. the kids there. I mean, you need they're his children. Right. 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 So we need to we need to choose the right people. Okay? And and then when you have people, when I ran my club, Erwin and I, we did judo five days a week. Right. Five days a week. It's got to be social. There's got to be things that we do in the club that kids want to be there for. They need to know these kids further than just a guy on the mat that they're banging heads with. So you need to have team building events. You need to have certain events, dinners, the, all sorts of things you do, parties. I mean, listen, you know, I mean, stuff like that, that brings people close together and feel they're really a part of a club. You can't, your goal can't be the, to have the best judo club. Your goal has got to be to have the best club because you're competing with gymnastics and soccer and hockey and everything else. There's got to be a reason to go there. Paul gets that. That's why kids come there. You know, their kids, their parents believe their kids are going to be better for going to that school. Right. So it can be taught. It can be taught. Okay. As mm -hmm. far as the judo skill, it, that's going to take a little more time. Now I've given teacher clinics where I don't put my gi on. I give everyone a pad and we sit down and we discuss how to teach judo. How do you see people? You know, our, the numbers that we have are so small, you know, it's so hard to find really good people that really can see judo. You know, and I'm sure, Rick, you have that problem with refereeing, too. You know, people, they try hard. They mean well. They can't see. They can't see. Uh, it's, you know, we have to start training people at different levels. You know, Steve, I know. Steve, yeah. I'm sorry. I, I, I thought I was looking for a time to break in here. There, let, let me ask you this. There, there seems to be three major organizations in judo, USA Judo, USJ, USJF, and they all seem to be trying to do the same thing and compete with each other. And as a result, it costs a lot of money. And, and there really doesn't seem to be a game plan to develop grassroots and the intermediates and the Olympics. What, what do you think has to happen to get the structure, which you spoke of, alluded to before, that was off key. So, what do you think we have to do to get the structure so that there are different levels and USJA, JF understands their function, USA Judo, somebody comes in. Uh, well, I, yeah, what do you think? Well, as far as I'm concerned, you take the JA, JF, and JI and throw it out the window. It's all about Judo. You know, I don't care what club, what affiliation you are. We got to get in here. We got to work together. If we want to build our sport you know, and build our athletes and make coaches better. You know, I need competition for my club to be good. Me being the best by far and no one else competing doesn't do anything for me. We need to build a strong, strong country of judo. So I'll give well, you, let me give you a few ideas that what I did. When, when I was, when Erwin and I ran our club, we had, we had junior tournaments in our club. We had a club big enough to do it. We brought the coaches in. And we, we demanded every single club that come have a kid. It could be a, it could be a 13, 14 year old kid and the kid's going to referee. I brought a, a, an A referee in at that time it was K. So what we would do was we would have the kids go out there and fight in a two minute nonstop match. So no matter how many scores you had, you could, the, the coach could stop the match or not. So you had the kids fighting in, in a very, uh, friendly environment. You had the coaches working together and talking and helping each other out. You had kids learning how to referee. You're developing referees from kids and they're getting on the mat without a fear of having parents yell at them 
have been being uh, scolded by an A referee for not making the right call, whatever. You start building from the bottom up and making people, you know, a part of it. So you start, you know, every club that goes to a tournament should have a referee. I go to a tournament now, the average age of referee is 65. It's horrible. It's horrible. We need to start building from the bottom up and working together. And in my mind, sitting here today, the only way to do it is at the club level now. That's my thought, the club level. We have a number of islands of excellence, but it, it seems there needs to be some sort of ferry service to, to bring all this together, do you think? And how, how might that happen from what's in place or not in place now? We, we need a new leader who understands yeah. judo, understands what it takes to develop, <coughs> to put a 12-year plan together. 12 years. It's going to take 12 years to build this up again. And we're going to need money. We need to be able to mimic what Paul does, what my nephews do. We need to have clubs in Washington, D.C. that have 150 people in New York, you know, in California. We need to start bringing people into judo from the grassroots. And that's where you raise your money. Increase your membership. Here's a good idea. If you join the membership, you get a magazine. Wow. It's a novel idea. <laughs> I mean, it's just, there, there's so much we can do from the, from the, from the grassroots level <clears throat> and work together and help each other out. <clears throat> Steve, can I say one thing? Sure, Paul. So when I started my club, it, I, I started it at a grassroots level. It took me seven years before I trained athletes to compete at the national level. And they weren't that good. And I knew I couldn't be in a hurry to get there either. Now that I got them there, I got them to a certain point. That's why I'm so involved with Steve because he's helping, he's helping train me so I can train my kids to take it to the next level. And Steve is so point on when he, you have to help each other. He's done so much to my kids at my club. With we've, we've had more than one session. I've had four or five sessions with Steve, with my kids. My kids know him. My kids love him. But I can't get my kids to the level that Steve can. So it's been a, nice, it's been a great process of Steve, me, him teaching me along with my kids. Since, you know, yeah, I've been doing this a long time, and I'll be the first to say I don't know everything. And Steve knows more than I do. And I, and I, I appreciate when he comes into the mix and, and, and works with my kids. Because not only is he teaching me his kids, he's teaching me. And then I won't say anything after that, Steve. I appreciate it. Thanks. Well, today, more than ever, we could work long distance. We really can. Today, uh, Paul put up a computer and I watched his class. And after I watched his class, I called the girls, the athletes over, and I, and I critiqued them. Uh, told them what they did right, what they did wrong, and what they need to work on. And we'll do it again. And I'm able to do it from my home. So we have that ability now to actually help each other out from a distance. Okay? We have to work together. We have to work together. Okay? Paul is not new to judo. Paul's been doing judo for how many years, Paul? 40 years now? 50. Paul knows judo. Yeah. It doesn't mean... It doesn't mean that his teaching skills are great, but he's someone that could learn and become a great teacher. You know, it doesn't happen by osmosis. I mean, teachers today, go, they go to school for four years and they're still not really good until they're in a system for another 10 years. You know what I mean? It takes years to learn and deal with kids. When you're teaching judo, you can't teach a move straight ahead because kids move, they change. You know, they move an inch. When I'm teaching kids a move and it works great and then they can't do it again, it's because some of the angle changed a quarter of an inch and everything changed for them. Judo's not easy to teach. You know, it's difficult. So, I mean, it's something that we need to teach our teachers. We need first to learn to, to give them a foundation. And, and we have people, whether it's Jimmy and Jason and people that are elite coaches that teach elite people, but the kids that go to their clubs don't have foundations. So Jason's teaching someone how to stand when he should be teaching them a strategy of how to get the Uchimata off against a Russian who's grabbing over the top on the other side. That's what Jason does great. You know, teaching someone how to stand up straight is not his job. 
they should come to him, you know, with, with, with that with that knowledge. So it's 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 a problem. We we would have to really restructure, you know. Uh, we have the people and the knowledge. We just have to restructure. Are there uh, any other questions that anyone would like to uh, have Steve discuss? Uh, I think we're at the one hour mark, Bob, Rob. Y yes, yeah, we are. So is that about where we stop or do you want to continue? Well, it, it's up to you. I, I'm just the, the technical guy here. But okay. I, I, it seems that restructuring uh, is, is a good point. Uh, how to do that, maybe that's the next step. But Steve, do you, do you have any closing advice for, for all of us, <laughs> words of wisdom? Can I ask a question sure. first? Hi, this is Mickey. I'm just saying, Steve, in your long career, this is changing the talk that I know, but in your long career, is there anything you wish you had done differently? <clears throat> oh, God. Uh, you know, probably, probably. You know, it's very interesting that in when I was younger and I was competing in, in the 70s <clears throat> and I had some difficulty with the organization, as Jim will tell you, it could beat you down. And I decided it was time for me to leave in 77. Uh, up until that point, judo was the most important thing in my life. There was nothing more important, not school, not girls, nothing. I lived, ate, drank, and slept judo. Uh, that was it for me. You know, when I came out of retirement in 85, and I did have some pretty good success that way, but I had three kids. And judo could never be the most important thing to me anymore, because when you have kids, obviously that's more important. You have a wife. And so do I wish I would have maybe stayed on a little longer? You know, I won the nationals in 77. I was number one when I left. Should I have stayed on? I still was playing at the top of my game. Maybe I wish I would have stayed a little longer. Uh, you know, uh, but I, that, 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 that's that's about it. You know, I, I, I don't know. I'm sure other people may think different. I, I don't Do know. Do you think that if you had a more balanced life throughout, you know, that it, judo wasn't the number one thing, if you had a more balanced life uh, before 77, that would have helped you through to stay longer? I, I have no idea. I have, you know, it's, it's, it's interesting that that when it, it, as my life went on, every time I was, whether it was business or anything else I did, I always went back to my competitive nature and my judo upbringing uh, uh, to get me through. So I don't, I don't know if that's the case, Mickey. I don't know. It might be. It, it might be. You know, I, find my, I found myself in my life in, in unique situations where I ended up taking over a public company probably before I was ready to do it. And I had to find a way to, to get through and, and run the company. And my experience in judo and, you know, certainly uh, getting on the mat against a, uh, a six foot 10 Chinaman who looked like he was a, a monster and, and going out there and fighting him, I knew that, that, that fear was not something I had, to, I, I had to have. You know, I mean, I knew that, that what, whatever was in front of me, I was able to tackle. So judo play, played a really big role for me in my life and the way I did things. I'm, I'm sure I'm sure maybe if I did things different, it would have come out different. I don't know. I don't know. Uh, but I, I know that the kids that I taught, the kids that came through my program that were good judo players and national champions, the, 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 the program we had and what judo did for them is that these kids are doctors, lawyers, chiropractors, businessmen, and, and they will tell you and their parents will tell you it was judo that made the difference for them. So judo has a tremendous value. And if you ever take a look at how France promotes judo, it'll tell you exactly how we should promote judo. Well, that's true. You know, uh, one thing, I, how you can tell how much you affected your students is when they bring their kids to you too. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Right. You know, and it's, it's wonderful. And it's, you know, something, it's not only that they bring their kids to you, they stay in touch with you. 
they stay in touch with you. You know, I mean, you, you're invited to their weddings. You're there for their kids. They want, you know, I mean, it had, you know, my life is full with my former students and uh, at all different levels, levels. And of course, Bobby is like my brother. I'm talk to Bobby all the time. We're together all the time. Uh, so yeah, I mean, there's so many great redeeming values for judo. We just don't know how to sell them. And that's a, that's a, that's a shame. Right. And the carryover values to your careers and the rest of your life from participating in judo are really invaluable. Without a doubt. Without a doubt. Really invaluable. And, uh, you know, it's funny. And Mickey, I'll tell this to you because it has to do with your dad. I I know your dad since I'm eight years old. You know, I remember in 1974 when my Irwin and I were fighting for the grand championship leading up to that. And we were all alone. It was just him and I, and it was your dad who was with me. And up until the time I was done, even when I was the Olympic coach, he was coming up to me, hitting me in the head and saying, what are you doing? What's going on? <laughs> he couldn't get away with that now. But... And, and, and the, the truth is, is that that relationship I valued from the time I was eight until the time he wasn't with us. And, and wh- where do you have that? The, the, the value of judo is so great we don't know how to sell it. We don't okay. know how to sell it. That's a shame. Right. And shame. maybe somehow developing a best practices, not concerning teaching judo initially, but concerning marketing judo to the general public would be beneficial. There is no outreach to the general community on a massive level to get people back in. The Washington Judo Club had ads in the papers. The Washington Judo Club gave demonstrations all over the Washington metropolitan area. Right. The Washington Judo Club had, with Jimmy Takimori's leadership and others, had people giving lectures at various schools and inviting people in. The marketing aspect of BJJ, for example, could be emulated by certain judo clubs. Listen, we have a girl who's a two-time gold medalist with a story that will touch anybody. She's a brilliant speaker (laughs) and we kicked her out. Hello. (laughs) What can I tell you? Right. So I, I, uh, I, I, I think that we, we have what we need. We just have no one who knows how to use it. And it's, 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 it's a shame, Jim. It's, yeah, it's, it's a real shame. I it's agree. A real shame. I think that, you know, <clears throat> and just a suggestion to you guys is that, you know, uh, <clears throat> having my nephew Aaron and Paul and maybe one or two people on a call for people that have really big clubs and have people come on and ask them questions. I think that's an excellent idea. Because I got to tell you something, you have 150 students, you know, you've got, you've got a story to tell. (laughs) Right. So Rob, let's put that on our agenda. Done. Thank you. And and, and one other knock at at the organization, whatever organization we're talking about, none of these clubs have all their kids involved in an organization. There's no reason to join an organization. An organization doesn't give them any value. The only reason they join is so they could fight in a tournament. Right. If they didn't have to fight in the tournament, they wouldn't join. Again, and back, back in the day, there were reasons to join. Absolutely. But those reasons have disappeared because all of those support functions, starting with a good magazine and publicity, the are book. no longer available anywhere. It, it's, 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 it's a shame. It's right. just a real shame. And the truth is, just to put it somewhat back on the tracks wouldn't take a lot. Mm-hmm. To rebuild it would take a lot, but just a little bit, you know, a little bit would put it back on, on, on the tracks. Okay, well, maybe we can get a lot of like-minded people discussing this and figure out a way to get it back on the tracks. Yeah, well, listen, you're going to talk to Jason and Jimmy, and I would be surprised if they had uh, their views were much, they're not as old as I am, but their views probably won't be much different than mine. I would agree with that. 
So I'd like to thank all of our participants. Thank Mickey and everyone who participated. And thank you very much, Steve. And I want to commend you on a brilliant coaching career Thanks, and sir. a brilliant competitive career. Founder of the U.S. Judo Association. Nice seeing most of you. <laughs>